It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we welcome, of course, those who have joined us by live stream. Also, <clears throat> this will be a 22nd message in this series on the second coming of Christ, the punishment of the wicked. <clears throat> now, candidly, this is not a pleasant subject to address, but it, it must be addressed. Now, here's a sort of a holy logic behind this we, the people of God are told Aven, avenge not yourselves uh, God means that vengeance is mine God said I will repay as for you love your enemies do good to those that despitefully use you and pray for them what God's going to do is bad enough. Yes. They don't need any bad stuff from you. Amen. And this is this is the reasoning behind this. That's right. Because, see, very few people are convinced mm -hmm. that God's going to punish the wicked. Yes. Yeah, right. Whoever's living wickedly, they aren't convinced of it. Yeah. And professing Christians that are wallowing in the pig pen of sin, they don't believe this. Yeah. Oh, my, I understand that intellectually, academically, they believe it, but they don't. They're not really convinced of it. See, we have fled to Jesus for refuge yes, amen. from the wrath to come. Right. See, we're convinced of this. Yes, Where we, I mean, those of us that are in Christ Jesus. It's always been the case. Now, I want to emphasize that the coming of Christ is associated with finalization, not with history. Now, these days, because, because preachers have quit talking about the second coming of Christ, all of the people that have erroneous views have popped up and they're belching it out, and it's become popular, and it's on the TV, and the Left Behind series of books and all this, because there's been a, there's been a silencing of preaching on this subject. And if you think there hasn't, you haven't been living long. It has. In the last 40 years, there's been a... Because you can't capitalize on this. You can't build an institution on this, I can tell you for sure, and you can't make a career on this. This teaching of Christ's second coming is absolutely something, if it's the truth, is something that men cannot make a career out of or capitalize on or make money off of. It just isn't that sort of thing. It brings glory to God, and it brings comfort to the saints, and is designed to put fear into the ungodly. <clears throat> now, his coming, Christ's coming, is going to be when he's disclosed who he really is. The first time he came to earth, he came incognito. He was disguised as a man. He came in the form of man and in the likeness of sinful flesh. See, people didn't know who he was. They're the only ones who didn't. Satan knew who he was. <laughs> he never even argued with Jesus. Not so much as one time did Satan put up an argument with Jesus. Demons, they knew who he was. When that Gadarene demoniac had a legion of demons in him, just a moment, for, let me pause for a moment. If a person can have a legion of de that's in the thousands, it can have a legion of demons in them, how much Holy Spirit do you think they could have in them? Amen. Oh, something to ponder about. <laughs> something to ponder about at any rate, isn't it? I can't imagine that you could, a person could have more of the devil than of God. God's always outdone the devil. Amen. He always has. So that gives you kind of an idea of the capacity of the human spirit. Amen. It's, it's mind-boggling, actually, when you think about it. And the Scripture talks about us being filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Be filled with the Spirit. See, so that, at any rate, it's something to ponder. But when Jesus comes again, God's going to disclose who he is. 
He's not coming incognito. He's not going to sneak in and then sneak out. He's not going to come so sinful men can see him. He's going to be revealed from heaven. Here's how the scriptures put it in 1 Timothy 6.15. It says of God, which is only in his own times, he will show. Put him on display. Who is, not who was, shall be, Jesus, who is the blessed and only potentate. He is the only really powerful person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All others are pretenders or feigning. He's the only potentate, all powerful one. Right now, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right now. Amen. If he wasn't, you could never have been saved. Yeah. Amen. It takes somebody like this for you to be saved. Yes. They got to hold off Satan, hold off the principalities and powers. And that he's that what he's going to be shown. When he comes again, that's when he's going to be revealed mm -hmm. or shown. <clears throat> that's the meaning of he shall come in his glory. Glory. The glory of a thing is what can be seen of it. Yes. So Paul said there's a glory of the sun. It's what can be seen of it. The glory of the moon is what can be seen of it. There's glory of stars, what can be seen of it. So the glory of a thing is what is what can be seen yes. of it. When Jesus was glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration, you could see mm -hmm. his glory. When he comes a second time, he's going to come in all of his glory. Amen. <laughs> you can't hide that. Amen. He just had a little bit of glory popped out in the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes. And it was a frightening experience for the mm -hmm. Peter, James, and John. I'm going to show him who's the blessed and only potentate. Peter says, 1 Peter 4.13, Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. See, now... We love him, though we see him not, Peter said. All we know about Jesus is what God has testified of him. None of us have ever seen him. None of us have ever heard him. We just got a testimony about who he is. And you've got a lifetime to believe that testimony. That's a little slice of time been allotted to you to believe that Jesus is everything God said he is. But when he shows him, then everybody's going to know that was, that was right, what they said about Christ. Going to be revealed in all of his glory. <clears throat> now, Christ is not returning to fight the wicked. He's, he's already defeated all the foes. Mm -hmm. There are no foes left for Jesus to defeat. Amen. Mm -hmm. He defeated the devil. Hebrews 2.14 says he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, by his death. That is, at his weakest point, his death, he defeated the devil thoroughly and once and for all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he plundered or spoiled principalities and powers that governed the world. Colossians 2.15 says principalities and powers and heavenly places, he's, he plundered them. And he destroyed the last enemy, the last one is death, and he's already destroyed that. So there's no further enemies for Jesus to destroy. Right. All he's got to do is show up and his enemies are dissipated. Amen. Boy, that's good, good news. Amen. I say that because some think there's going to be a big, big war when Jesus comes back. Huh? Poor people. They don't realize what he's done already. He's coming to end the tyranny of the wicked. He's going to destroy them with the brightness of his coming and the breath of his mouth. Take the ac accumulation of all inimical powers, Satan, principalities and powers, demons, and on down, and all Jesus has to do is go, mm -hmm. that's the end. So he's not coming to destroy the wicked. He's coming to reveal that stuff you heard in the gospel yeah. about me overthrowing the powers of wickedness. 
You, everyone's going to know it for sure. It'll be a glad day for people who trusted in it here. It'll be a sad day for those that didn't. Now let's talk for a moment about the certainty of the punishment of the wicked. Once you see this, I say, you will not have a hard time with what God says for you to do with your enemies. This will take vindictiveness out of your spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, will, and it, does, it needs to be out. Because yeah. right. God has already said, vengeance belongs to me. I am the only one that pays back. That means you shouldn't think about this evil well, if I could just. Uh -huh. That means you can't think about this either. That's right. yeah. And beside that, like, how important does a person think they are that they could get upset because someone opposed them? Why, well, I don't know everybody here personally, and you don't know me personally, but if we did, we could all find a whole lot of reasons why people should treat us bad. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> As I have said, once you're convinced of this, that God's going to punish the wicked, mm -hmm. that like liberates you from yes. staying awake at night. You know, people stay awake at night thinking about this. I've known people personally that have nurtured hatred for 20, 30, 40 years yeah. and never got over it. All right, this is what, what I'm going to tell you now will free you from that. God has spoken about the punishment of the wicked. As far back as Job, now that's before there was a Bible and before there was a law. Job 4, 8, and 9. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. So all God has to do is just breathe on them, and that's it. That's a very prosaic way of saying it, but... It's certain. See, even Job knew. Job knew this was the case. The psalmist, Psalm 32, 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord mercy shall compass him about. So if you've made it your purpose, you know, to make people sorrowful, like tonight, Resolve you'll never do that. They got enough sorrow coming, they don't need any from you. I'm serious about this. Because there are some people that have suffered some very wrong things. They've been punished unjustly. And you could build a, a large case about why it shouldn't have happened. When you're done building it, God is the one that's going to dole out yes. the sorrow and the punishment. They shall perish. Many sorrows shall compass them. Wait them. Here's a divine pledge in Isaiah 13. 1. He says, I will punish the wicked. I will punish the wicked. Again, Jesus said, the chaff will be burned up. He's going to burn the chaff, that's the wicked. The wheat, they're the people of God. I'm going to burn up the chaff. Romans 25, 46, he says of the wicked, these shall go away to everlasting punishment. I'm showing now the certainty of the punishment of the wicked. Romans 2, 5 says, Indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish to those that don't do good. God's going God's gonna to do that. Philippians 3, 18 and 3, 18, Paul said there are some who seek their own, and he said, God's going to, whose end is destruction, God's going to destroy these people who seek their own instead of the things that belong to Christ. Again, Colossians 3.25, 
People that do wrong, quote, shall receive for the wrong they have done. It's assurance of the punishment of the wicked. And they're reserved to everlasting destruction, our, t our text said, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 9, they're reserved to be punished. So you say, how? Why did the wicked continue? I mean, why? Why are they just like taken out of the way? They're reserved right. to be punished. Now God's reserved them now for 6,000 years for the punishment we're talking about here. He, he's reserved them for 6,000 years. None of them are going to escape Amen. at all. None of the wicked. And he's going to execute judgment on them as even Enoch prophesied in Jude 1.15. Now, these are uh, promises on which you must learn to reckon mm -hmm. that these things are going to happen. Yes. The wicked will be punished, and they will not escape. Amen. Now, let's address the question, but why will they be punished? Why will the wicked be punished? Why is this necessary? First of all, it's necessary because God made man to seek him. Yes, yeah. Acts 17, 26, and 27. This is a part of the message Paul preached at, on Mars Hill to the Athenian philosophers. He said that God hath made of one blood, that's one person who was Adam, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, you've got to believe this when he said yes. this. God determined where people were going to live and when they were going to live. Yeah. That's what he said here. Yeah. Uh -huh. God determined the times, the period in which they're born, and where they were going to live, that... They should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though it be not far from every one of us. So God is positioned. Every person that's ever been born has been positioned geographically and in time so they could seek the Lord. Amen. And nobody can say, we didn't know we were supposed Amen. to seek him. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It's built in their spiritual DNA. Yeah, that's right. yes. Now some folk settle for an idol. Or a false god. This is why God made man. And if a man isn't seeking God, I mean, it doesn't make any difference, brethren, what nation they're in yes. or what time slot they're in. If they didn't seek God and feel after him, if perchance they might find him, even though he's not far enough from every one of us, they've been disobedient. Yes. No excuses. If you've ever preached overseas, which I have, I have done, I had to inform people of this, particularly in India, and remind them they did kill Thomas, the apostle. But the situation can be rectified. I got, you bring, we're bringing good news to people like this, but they've got to know. <laughs> God made you, he put you here, he put you in time, so you'd seek after God, and if you don't do it, you are going to pay the price. I'm uh, elaborating here on why the wicked will be punished. And they didn't glorify God. Speaking of the Gentile world, Romans 121, Paul said, because that when they knew God, that they knew him in an introductory sense. They didn't know him in an in-depth sense. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's why the Gentile world dropped off the moral scale. Mm -hmm. And if you read Romans 1, which covers the sin of sodomy, yeah. you will find that it is preceded by these words, God gave them over. 
See, sodomy, the prevalence of sodomy is your proof that God's not in the house. Yeah, amen. Uh -huh. amen. It's a proof that God's abandoned wherever this is happening. Yeah. It's a terrible thing to say, I know that. But the fact that this happened, that people, Romans 1, that whole chapter there, he accounts for the degeneracy, the moral degeneracy that happened in the Gentile world. And he says they kept on getting worse and worse, so finally just God said, that's it. And he let them fall off the end. And that's, that's the text where sodomy broke out. Man with man, woman with woman. That's where that's where it happened. Yeah. Right there is where it happened. So you can tell people if you want that God loves the sodomite. It may sound nice, but you will have a hard time substantiating that. Yeah, right. You're on your own. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's serious. It was even serious under the law. Serious. But see that God's accounting for why he's going to punish the wicked. That that could happen, barring the belief of the gospel and being born again, where that that takes a person out of this, <laughs> praise God, out of this category. So that they may say a lot of Christians may say once were some of you these once you were you were this way, some of you were this way. We we admit, we admit that there are a lot of people in Christ now that led formerly lived like that. But they're not like that anymore. Amen. That's the good news, of course, that we bring to people. You don't have to be that way anymore. This Romans 1 text elaborates some, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. Is all that serious? Well, if you're talking about God's universe, yes, it's serious. Yeah. If you're talking about committing these things right under the nose of God, yes, it's serious. If you're talking about God made these people to seek him, if happy they might find him, yes, that's serious. Serious enough, God will not overlook it unless they believe the record he's given of his son. Yeah, that's another, that's another story, praise the Lord. Again, why will the wicked be punished? Romans 3.12 Speaks of humanity. God looked for, see if there was somebody that was good. The psalmist two times quotes this from this, this passage from which Romans 3, 10 and following are taken. He quotes it, Psalmist quotes it two times, 14 and 52 or 3, I believe, 52 or 3. He said, they have all gone out of the way. Going out of the way means they're off the highway. They got off the one road that leads to God. They've gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's, that's a divine assessment of humanity. And if you wonder how God views a collective, like a, a, a large collection of these kind of people, you've got the flood to give you an example of how God would treat it like a mass of people. And we've talked about this before, about how many people were in the flood, you know. And I shared this with you before, that let's say that the, I'm showing you here that what a tremendous curse this was, the flood. Let's say the human race doubled every year, starting with Adam. The human race doubled every year. By the time of the flood, which is roughly around 1600, you do the math yourself, see if I'm not telling you the truth, that number be, goes over one trillion. Hmm? Goes over one trillion. Now there were a lot of deaths, I know, but they're all so long lives. So we're talking about a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of people. This was not just like a regional flood or they didn't have all the, they didn't have majority of water wasn't on the face of the earth back in those days. The majority was land, yeah, yeah. watered from the from beneath. Yeah. So that shows us what, what, this is God now. Amen. And there were no tears in heaven about this. Mm -hmm. This is God, what, how he can handle like a, a mass of 
humanity. He demonstrated it, just so you know. Don't. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. Don't provoke him. Are you stronger than God? Paul said this to the church of Corinth. 1 Corinthians 10, 22. He says, Thou shalt not provoke the Lord thy God. Are you stronger than God? I mean, you think you, think you could come out a winner with a conflict with God? I'm showing you why the wicked are punished. By wicked in this case, people that die wicked, we're talking about. They are children of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So they just come from a family of disobedient people. And disobedience is justifies condemnation. Mm -hmm. Only God could resolve this dilemma by a great salvation. You understand this? Nobody else could resolve this dilemma yeah. of a race of people that justly deserved condemnation. But God in his infinite wisdom and as a display of his mercy which yields to his righteousness, his righteousness is his predominant trait. Yeah. He can't save anybody unless it's right. Amen. Now enters Jesus. <laughs> Jesus made it right to save people, remit their sin, and have them born again. Unless that happens, children of disobedience. And people, Ephesians 4.18 tells us people were alienated from the life of God that's hostile toward it and inimical to it alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them according because of the blindness of the heart. The fact that they were ignorant of God, they weren't acquainted with him, they didn't know God, they couldn't understand God, that is just cause for condemnation. Yes. You, got, you got to see this. Yeah. This was just cause if God made people to know him, then not to know him is wrong. Romans 1, 28, they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. Think of Thessalonians 2, 10, they didn't receive the love of the truth so they could be saved. Recently, I had a little discussion with someone what it takes to be saved, you know, and this is a, the background I come from, this was a hot, hot issue, and someone had worked out a nice convenient plan, you know, for it, but. No one ever, I never heard, from my background, anyone say you had to receive the love of the truth. I never heard anybody say that, except my father, but the Lord. I didn't hear him say it, that you have to receive the love of the truth. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And it goes on, because they didn't receive the love of the truth... God sent them strong delusion that they might believe a lie that all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So much for the notion God can't make anybody do something against their will. Yeah. He can't? He can't? Well, we'll have to call Nebuchadnezzar and some people like that to the witness stand to teach you. Well, no, that's, not, that's, not, that's an oversimplification. That isn't the case at all. Here's the truth of the matter. If a person chooses not to believe God, which is, is focusing on the gospel of Christ, God will dictate that they believe a lie and they'll not be able not to believe it. Amen. Yeah, right. That's what that text says. Now we're coming on why he condemns people. And he'll believe, condemn those who don't believe. Jesus said, he that, believe in, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Those that believe not shall be damned. Yes. Uh, he, mean, he, he means this. Amen. Yes. This is not just rhetoric mm -hmm. or oratory. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to believe? It means you lean, you lean the way to your soul. On, yes. Amen. You depend on Jesus to save you. Uh -huh. yes. That's what it means. Yes. Again, 1 John 5.10 he that believes that Jesus, that he that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. 
He that believes not has made God a liar because he receives not the record he has given of his son. So the gospel is called the record, 1 John 5, 10 and 11, the record God gave of his son. You know only as much about Jesus as God has testified Amen. That's right. in the gospel. That's all you know about Jesus, but that's enough yes. to save you. All right, now he that, don't, don't, he that doesn't receive that witness will be punished. Now that's why God, see there's, so there's reasons why God will punish the wicked. It isn't just because God's mad. No, that's not what it is. It's not like God throwing a fit. It's, that's not what it is. Is that there's no alternative to this. God can't allow rebels. There's already been one rebel in heaven. There's never going to be any more. There's already been one. He was pitched out with his angels. Now the only thing that remains is, is when will this happen? When will the wicked be punished? Well, the modern heralders of the second coming of Christ, they don't take a lot of time to tell you when they're going to be punished. They just tell you about the battle of Armageddon, bad war on earth, and mark on the forehead, and mark in the hand, and tell you about all that, you know, and the Antichrist, and son of perdition, and man of sin, scare people half to death. But when you read the scripture, the thing you get out of Revelation isn't this spiritual despot that's going to put a mark on a hand and a forehead. It's that he's not going to win. Amen. That's right. mm -hmm. The message of scripture is Satan loses, mm -hmm. Antichrist loses, mm -hmm. demons lose, mm -hmm. wicked lose. That's the message of Revelation. It's not like scaring people, you better shape up or you may get the mark. Mm -hmm. Not be able to buy a loaf of Wonder Bread at Walmart. <laughs> Unless... Well, you'd be surprised how many people have believed that. We had a lady, she's gone to be at the Lord now. What was her name? Anna Pardon? Anna May. Yeah, Anna May. She was about 90 years old. And she came to me one night, she was crying. And she was scared. She got this magazine about the mark of the beast. And she says, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to, to stand. I'm, af I'm afraid I won't be able to resist. And she was frightened. I mean, this elderly woman was frightened. And I said, give, give me that magazine. I'm going to take this magazine now. And then I told her what was going to happen to Antichrist. I said, the important thing you've got to see is what's going to happen to Antichrist, not what he's going to do. She was relieved of that and testified of it at one of our renewals. She stood up and she wasn't used to talking before people, but she told that, told that experience. And I thought, I wonder how many people are like that, shaking and quaking because of what they think is coming, that they won't be able to hold up under it. But the wicked are going to be punished when Jesus comes. Now that's the point that I want to establish at this point. Now our text actually said that. <laughs> said he's going to punish the wicked when, this is for Second Thessalonians 1 7. He said, Now, now you that are you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Then he says he's going to destroy the wicked with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. And then verse 10 says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Yeah. That's when that's going to happen. Yeah. When he comes to be glorified in his saints, that is, he, they will have the glory he's got. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's going to appear in his glory and we'll be transformed to be like he is, for we'll see him as he is. That's what yeah. 1 John 3, 2 says. Philippians 3.21 20, says he will come in all of his glory and then we'll be glorified with him. That's when the wicked are going to be punished. When he comes to be glorified in the saints. I know it's common people 
it's common teaching that he's going to come in undetected and going to wake up in the morning and a tremendous population is going to be missing. Planes will have crashed in the mountains because the pilot was raptured. Cars will be vacated on the run on the highways. And this is a, been a series of 12 books. The, uh, what was the name of that series of books? Left yeah, Left Behind series. Uh -huh. Scare people. Yeah. Be, be, frighten people. Mm -hmm. When it's plainly said, I mean, I don't, well, I'm going to develop this just a little bit more. Matthew, this is words of Jesus, Matthew 25, 31 and 32. Then the Son of Man, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the angels with him, he shall sit on the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And that's the text there where he says, Inasmuch you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Inasmuch you did it not to the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. That's the text where that is given. And it's, it's an elaboration of the parable of the ten virgins, which is clearly about the coming of the Lord. For his saints. When he comes for his saints, he, he's not going to leave the wicked. This would be an insult to the saints. It says that, you know, one, some will be taken, some will be left, just like in Noah's day, just like in Sodom. Let me ask you, who was left in Noah's day? Well, it wasn't the wicked. Was it? But he said that's what's going to, that's what's going to be like. Who was left in Sodom? Was Lot. So who's left he is the saints. Yes, amen. When he comes to be glorified in his saints, mm -hmm. to be admired in all those that believe, comes in all of his glory, and he's seen. Mm -hmm. Before the wicked are taken away, they're going to see this. This was the one, and the yes. song of Jeremiah is going to be sung. Summer is gone, the harvest is past, and we're not saved. Yes. And there'll be nothing they can do about it. Right. When Jesus comes... Now, the secret, uh, brethren, is for you to be patient mm -hmm. until that day. Mm -hmm. don't, uh, don't take matters into your own hands. Mm -hmm. No matter how bad your experience has been. Mm -hmm. he, Jesus is going to do it, and you do it perfectly. Yeah. One more text about this, Matthew 24, 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day that he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. That's when he comes. Right. And Jesus said in Luke 9, 26, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words... Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's glory and the holy angels. That's when it's going to happen. Now, one final word. What will the punishment be? Well, we're just obviously can only deal with the fringe of the garment. I mean, it doesn't go into a lot of details, but... 2 Thessalonians 1 9 refers to it as everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Now, in the Bible, when you read the word destruction and hear everlasting destruction, it doesn't mean what it means in the earth. I've mentioned this to you before that there are two words, Bible words, for which there is no language in the world that has a, uh, tr has a word for these two words. One is eternal mm -hmm. and the other is destruction. There is no human speech. They have the words eternal and destruction, I understand, but they, they do not have a, it's not translated. There is no language that has those two words. 
because they're outside the perimeter of human experience. Human knowledge cannot extend beyond the perimeter of human experience. See, but the destruction of the wicked, that's, that's outside. Destruction in the Bible is the opposite of sanctify. Sanctify means you're employed for good, God uses you for good purposes. Destruction means good for nothing. There will be nothing, nothing that the wicked will be productive in. There'll be nothing, there'll be no satisfaction of any kind. There'll be no realization of what they want. They will have cultured all their life, they will have cultured appetites for what's unlawful. They'll receive a body that doesn't, is not capable of carrying out those appetites, but they're going to have all the appetites anyway. They're going to have the appetites, but not be able to fulfill them. That's the language where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's what is depicted. Amen. This gnawing, goading, the drug addict or the drunkard will want, to, want this, but not be able to find it. He won't have the liberty of going insane or something like this. See, that's a torment. Amen. Those are the baser sins. Yeah. The person that wants recognition. Uh -huh. See, there'll be no friends in hell. Yeah, right. <laughs> there could not going to be any friends, co companions, projects that we work together on. None of that. Right. Everlasting destruction from the glory of the Lord and his power. That is, they will... As I understand it, they're going to be able to see, like the rich man, he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, remember? He saw him. He didn't say, could I come up there, Abraham? Is there room for me up there? Notice, he asked him to send Lazarus where he was, which was in hell. It says, and I, hell, he lifted up his eyes. He didn't want to go there, but he didn't want to stay where he was. That's a dilemma of the condemned. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to want to go to heaven. That's right. Everyone who cultured an appetite for the world, who didn't culture an appetite for God, when they see God face to face, they will not want to stay. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right. Just like they didn't want to stay with Jesus when they, they, they forsook him. Yeah. It's a terrible law. Uh, Terrible pen penalty to be. Everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. God will have no, there'll be no sustaining by God in hell. Yes. See, now we live in a world, he sustains it, keeps it orderly. There'll be absolute chaos in hell. Yeah. You didn't want me? Now you can't have anybody. Now, imagine, God doesn't get, like, enjoyment out of this. Don't, don't imagine that. God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, the Scripture says. But that God has no alternative. God is righteous. He cannot allow someone that rejects him to live with him. But there's some other things. There'll be outer darkness, Matthew 25, 30. Cast the unprofitable... Now, it's interesting that he talks about the lost as an unprofitable servant. Like, how many of these you think there are in, in Joplin? Well, I mean, I wouldn't attempt to. But there are some here, yes. as well as other cities. Unprofitable. See, people that weren't profitable to God, it didn't add to God's, God's purpose and glory, it didn't bring glory to him weren't faithful to handle what he gave them. Unprofitable servants. They'll be cast into outer darkness with a very, there's something about darkness that is fearful. We were in these, uh, visited these caverns in, up a little north here one time, Merrimack, I think it is took us into the interior of the cavern where there was no light penetrated there at all. And they, they turned out the lights. Whew, boy. They had you hold hands, you know, while they would, because they knew people would get scared. And I thought, boy. And outer darkness is worse than that. That's right. There when uh, the darkness fell on the Egypt, a plague of darkness, remember it was it said it could be felt. Yes. It's gonna be, that's gonna be I'm talking about the punishment of the wicked. 
everlasting fire, Revelation 20, 15, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a fire that doesn't consume. Like that burning bush. Fire that doesn't consume. What? But all of the discomforts associated with fire. If you've ever known someone that suffered massive burns, they'll tell you that there's no hurt like a deep burn. One of my sons, like a foster son, was fried by 40,000 volts of electricity. And every inch of his body was burned. And he told me, he said, he was a Vietnam veteran that was wounded in, in Vietnam. He said, there's no way to describe what this is like. He survived by the grace of God, but I'm, I'm telling you, that's a, that's a fearful thing to think about, everlasting, everlasting fire. That means it never runs out of fuel. See, you can't burn something without fuel. So the wicked aren't going to be like burned up. 